happy Thursday. Um, okay, Clue was a lot of fun, right? It was a little indulgent for me, but I loved that. And your guys' scores are perfect. It's kind of spooky, fun, horror, comedy, all those kind of things, you know, those keywords. Um, so we'll, we'll see that tomorrow for the, your results. But um, today we're gonna revisit two gentlemen that changed musical theaters, theater history, because they were one of the first we, we, we looked at this a while ago, so we're going to revisit very brilliant Gilbert and Sullivan. I am the very model of a modern major general, a information vegetable, animal and mineral. I know the kings of England and I quote the fights historical from Marathon to Waterloo in order categorical. I am very well acquainted too with matters mathematical. I understand equations both of simple and quadratical. About binomial theorem, I'm teeming with a lot of news. Lot of news. Got it. With many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. Many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. With many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. With many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. So these guys changed the the, the content uh, and the form of musical theater. This is opera, operetta, which is operettas tends to be shorter, right? It's a little different than the long Ver Verdi, Puccini operas. Uh, where you kind of mix songs with spoken dialogue and, you know, dance numbers and all these things. And light operas is another word that we've used with some spoken dialogue. Sometimes that dialogue is, is, is you know, sing, you know, sung and spoken as well. Um, and that kind of gets into early musical theater. So, uh, but what they did, and why I mentioned Monty Python, is what, what they did is that they, they would show a lot of their subjects um, uh, you know, like politics and social issues, and they'd address them in a witty way. So we're going to look at three three words, just so three key terms, just so we're on the same page. Of uh, they did it in a witty, witty way without sacrificing um, just being pure fun entertainment. So they did it, and uh, you know, in a way that was aff slightly offensive, but enough to be entertaining and witty, and not just you know so they would be burned at the stake. So what they, what, the three little terms that I just want to go over, they, they use satire. A lot of these we know. That's humor and irony, right? Exaggeration, that's, that, that's a, a way to, uh, to expose and criticize uh, you know, people's kind of unawareness and stupidity and all that stuff. So satire is a very effective way to, to, to do that. Um, parody is another word, is the second word. That's uh, also kind of uh, an exaggeration or an imitation of something, right? You can parody somebody, at least in this country, you can parody anybody and, and uh, you know, not be, uh, not be, well, I guess you can be canceled today because everything's canceled, but, uh, you know, uh, so parody. They're also, we're also going to talk, the third term is pastiche. I know these, that sounds like a big word, but really pastiche is really just uh, an artistic uh, work in the style that kind of, copies another work in a way, uh, imitates another work. Uh, so that's what, that's what, so those kind of three terms are what uh, Gilbert, who's the lyricist, the kind of, I, I mean, it's Arthur Sullivan's the, the composer, okay, but those kind of three terms are what Gilbert's going to really use, and the two of these guys are going to use in their libretti and all of their works that they write that are going to kind of not disrupt the establishment, but kind of poke at the establishment. We all like comedians and people that kind of poke gently, or sometimes not gently, at you know the established, uh, the established. So poverty is obsolete and hunger is abolished. We're, We're going, going to abolish it in England. The table in our native state has heard beyond a question of risky situation and indelicate suggestion. No peace is tolerated if it's costumed indiscreetly. In short, this happy country has been anglicized completely, completely, completely. It really is surprising what the time of We are both about to choke us like a lava lamp. In a very surprising group of the years, we are going to come and switch over to a lava So Gilbert and, Gilbert and Sullivan, um, Arthur Sullivan, the composer, wrote very catchy melodies, as we're hearing, and um, uh, Gilbert's uh, witty libretti, libretti satire, 
uh, formed the, that model of the 18th century musical theater that followed. So that is the Victoria, Victorian era uh, uh, partnership. So what, what do we know in the, in the history of, of England, the United Kingdom, Victorian era was under the realm of Queen Victoria, right? Uh, so that's like 1837 to 1901. So this is when they're writing. This is the Victorian era. We've talked about Victorian houses, architecture a little bit, um, but you know, so. Um, and the two of these guys collaborated on, on 14 uh, comedic operas between 1871 and 1896. Probably the most famous HMS Pinafore, Pirates of Penzance, and the Mikado are probably what they're most known for. So. Having said all this, let's get over to London, see where that even is from Hollywood to London. And uh, let's look at the timeline because I'm just I'm throwing out some dates and uh, we need to we need to picture these dates. So uh, this is when they're writing 1871 to around 1896. Who else is going on? So if they're writing light operas, we can go to Rossini who is going on in the, he's writing not super, he's not, he's kind of witty with his musical writing, um, but he's kind of stealing, not stealing, he, his biggest influence, Rossini's, you know, Barbara Seville, we know Rossini, is Mozart. Mozart is his biggest influence. Who else is going on? Wagner's going on at the same time. Wagner doesn't sound like Rossini at all. They're very different. Wagner's drenched in romanticism uh, and, uh, you know, maybe a little Mozart in there but uh, more probably Beethoven, but Wagner's, you know, creating this, we did a whole class on Wagner. Gilbert and Sullivan come right after Wagner's still alive, right after, but before George M. Cohen. Remember George M. Cohen? We talked about him, uh, like last 4th of July, I think. George M. Cohen was a Yankee Doodle Dandy, right? Um, he was kind of in influential with the book musical. So there's all this grand opera, light opera, and then kind of more sing, sing sung show tune-ish, tin pan alley. This is the early 20th century. And uh, Cohen wrote all of these great songs. And we looked at all of those great songs in Yankee Doodle Dandy, the movie that came out in 1942 um, with, you know, the great Jimmy Cagney. Gilbert and Sullivan's producer, um, he, he got these guys, he nurtured these guys' collaboration. He built the, the Savoy Theater. That was their playground um, in 1881 to present their works. Um, uh, and um, uh, Gilbert was born in London, 1836. His dad was a naval surgeon um, and he wrote novels and short stories. Uh, and um, to supplement income, uh, uh, Gilbert uh, began writing illustrated stories, poems and articles, and then Sullivan, the composer, was born in 1842. Uh, his father was a military band, band leader, but by the age of eight, he's a prodigy. He's writing music, uh, anthems, songs, studies at the Royal Academy of Music. We've talked about many composers, Benjamin Britten, um, studied there and uh, he starts, you know, he studies conducting too. So he was a classical composer in his own right, but it was really his collaboration with Gilbert that, you know, why we're talking about him today probably. <laughs> Shading with soft serenading, we sing them to sleep. We saw serenading, we sing them to sleep. We soft serenading, we sing them to sleep. So their first was this grand opera, and it was for Christmas entertainment. 
their first collaboration for this uh, 1871, and it was it was political satire and grand opera, with in a parody that was that was mimicking Offenbach, who's a famous composer of the era. So that was kind of their first m way of mimicking something that happened, and audiences loved that. Um, their first, their, they scored huge success with HMS Pinafore. That was 1878, and they really satir satirized the. Um, uh, unqualified people to positions of authority and so they're poking fun uh, good-natured fun at in this place uh, in the Royal Navy and um, and English is you know England's obsession with social status because it's all high-minded right in England but they would poke fun at these things interesting how, how they work together uh, mostly they uh, Gilbert the lyricist oversaw the design of the sets and the costumes so not only is he writing the stories and all of these things he's also directing these these things and he directed the performers on stage and he wanted realism in the acting um, he he didn't want the, the self-conscious interaction with the audience he he wanted the characters he never wanted the actors his characters um, to be aware of their own absurdity, so they would play it straight, and that's that's what made the comedy so great. I think. He also insisted that his actors, I mean. You couldn't change one word of his, so they had to they had to know it perfectly, and his stage direction had to be followed, and that was something new to actors on the stage today. Because again, this isn't grand opera; this is kind of getting into operetta. So it's not there's no improvisation here. So he was very strict about his words being followed, and their the actors unaware of their their own absurdity on, going on stage which of course adds to you know the humor in a better way i think the pirates of penzance is uh, one of their most famous ones too poked fun at grand opera so they're poking fun at their own profession in a way probably the mikado is their most famous work and this is um in 1885 and this made fun of the whole english bureaucracy um in a Japanese setting. Uh, this was their biggest, longest running hit, about 672 performances at the Savoy Theatre. Um, and uh, Mike Lee, the famous English director, made a great movie, Topsy Turvy, in 1999 about uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, and, and their production is the Mikado, which there, he kind of shows the development and the making of this opera. Three little maids from school are we, but as a schoolgirl well can be, filled to the brim with girlish glee. From school, everything is a source of fun. Nobody's safe, for we care for none. Life is a joke that's just begun. Three little maids from school. Three little maids who all unwary come from a lady's seminary. Three from a genius to Larry. Three little maids from school. Three little maids from school. So, I mean, Gilbert's lyrics uh, served, they were a model, they influenced so many people, including Cole Porter. We did a whole class on Cole Porter. Great songwriter, but also what? Lyricist, too. Cole Porter wrote music and lyrics, and that was something kind of unusual. I mean, as great as Richard Rogers was, he didn't really write, well, he didn't write lyrics. Um, as great as Gershwin was, he needed his brother Ira, you know, to, and Ira Gershwin was also influenced by G Gilbert's uh, writing. Both of them, even though they, they poked fun at the establishment, received knighthood, though, for, uh, for their accomplishments, and uh, so that was kind of cool. So these two guys really were innovative. Um, they introduced, you know, in content and form directly in, in really influenced musical theater writing up in, in, into the 20th century. So they're kind of, they're kind of out that by the 20th century, but their ideas are still being talked about. Their operas are still being performed. I, I guess I do love the music. I love the, the, the writing, but I really love what they were doing in terms of parody, pastiche, satire, those kinds of things, humor. 
uh, it's fun that we can have those in, you know, in musical theater, in music, in films. We have that. That's how we laugh and enjoy entertainment. So hope you enjoyed Gil Gilbert and Sullivan. Hope that wasn't too heady. I'm sure that was, that was fine. I mean, as you can see from their performances, it's, it's a lot, a lot of fun. And people loved this stuff. I mean, they were hugely successful and famous, as they should be. So interesting to think Gilbert and Sullivan, they, they, maybe they st helped start musical theater. Because we, we talked about that with Ziegfeld and with all the immigrants and the melting pot of coming into New York in the early 20th century, these guys go to Sullivan are in, you know, England, right? And it's not quite the 20th century yet, but they're getting less, it's getting, it's still classical music, but with how the lyrics are being adapted and, and the playfulness, and that goes back to Offenbach too, the playfulness, the classical playfulness, it's kind of getting somewhat musical theater-like. That could that you know could go back to Rossini too, but definitely by the early 20th century, there's songs right. There's like there's Ten Pan Alley and stuff. So these guys were just right at the cusp, but geniuses in their own right. So I hope you enjoyed Gilbert and Sullivan. Have a great rest of the day. Tomorrow, film scoring results for Clue. Okay, bye.